and turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark the 10th chapter. We're so thankful for your presence this morning to hear another portion of God's word to learn about our Savior. In Mark chapter 10, we're going to be studying this morning verses 28 through verse 21. We want to look at these verses and see how these verses can uh, benefit each of us in here this morning in some particular way. Again, the text says Mark chapter 10, and we are going to begin in verse number 28 of that particular text. The Bible says, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered, said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house or brethren or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children for or lads for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lads with persecutors in the world to come eternal life. Then he says in verse 31, but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. During 33 years of life, Christ has so many followers. He had done so many marvelous and great works. There were those who went above and beyond to make sure his message, the gospel message, was indeed going to be preached. Paul stated himself and our brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech, declaring among you to know the testimonies of God. Paul said, for I determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 2. Paul will go on to tell Timothy, for all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is literally breathed out of the mouth of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, for instruction, and righteousness, then Paul goes on to say that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Then Paul would again charge Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. What word is that, Paul? What word are we supposed to preach, Paul? the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. But as of their own lust shall they heed to themselves, teachers having itch and ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. But notice what Paul says to Timothy. For watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist made full proof of thy ministry. This morning, I would like to ask each of us a very simple, but yet a very, very important question. Keep this question at the forefront of your mind throughout this sermon. Just, just keep this question in your mind. And the question is simply, will you follow him? There were those who simply, as we can see with Paul, who would literally give their lives for the cause of Christ. And then you have those who would not. Judas let greed overtake his life, and it caused him to lose his soul. King Agrippa, the Bible says, he almost became a Christian. Festus wanted to wait for a more convenient season. The rich man, the Bible says, in hell or Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. The other rich man, he did not want to give up his earthly possessions in order to follow Christ. The chief priest wanted blood. The Jews, his own people, did not accept him to be the son of God. Many told, many today in the way they live, to reject Jesus Christ. We let pride, greed, fame distract us from the one we need the most, and that's Jesus Christ. Following Jesus is the best experience we can ever have here while on earth. Just think about all the great things you enjoy in life. We enjoy birthdays. We enjoy weddings. We enjoy graduations. 
We enjoy the days our children are born into the world, the day our children graduate from college, but the greatest day is still yet to come. The day when Christ comes back for his bride, the church. But before Christ comes back for the church, the question is simple. Will you follow him? When we follow Christ, it leads to so many blessings in life. Paul said, blessed be God, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where, Paul? In Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. There has never been a time when God has not cared about your needs. There has never been a time where God did not worry about you. There has never been a time God wanted to give you up. But very often, we are the ones who reject God. And the question is simple, will we follow him? What will we allow to distract us from our relationship with God? And in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, the apostle Paul begins to ask a series of questions. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sore? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are recounted as sheep full of slaughter. Paul says, now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul says, I am persuaded. I am convinced neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Before we examine this text this morning, we first want to impress some thoughts upon your mind. As we already know, much has happened in the life of Christ before we even get to the text Mark records. He has already done so many great, wonderful miracles up to this point in his life. He has already stopped the mouth of Satan. He has already taught his disciples how to pray. He outsmarted the chief priests time and time again. He has fulfilled so many prophecies already up to this point in his life. The disciples had an argument amongst themselves on who was the greatest in the kingdom. But when Christ asked them about this, they kept silent. Christ took this opportunity once again to teach them. Christ took a child, and he set a child in the midst of them. And the apostles, I guarantee you, never again forgot this experience. He wanted them over and over again to know who was the greatest in the kingdom, who was the greatest in the eyes of God. Following Jesus can not only change our lives, Following Jesus not only can change our lives, but it can get us into heaven. We are never going to be accepted into heaven except we follow Christ the way the New Testament teaches us to follow him. We are never going to enter into heaven. We are never really going to reach our full potential unless we do everything Christ has commanded us to do in our lives. The apostles walked with Christ. They lived with Christ. They prayed with Christ. They were taught by Christ. Yet in their minds, their only concern was who was the greatest in the kingdom. Very often, if we are not careful, this attitude can come into our own minds as well. Who then is the greatest in this? Who then is the greatest in that as well? I want to be the greatest in this. I want to be the greatest in that. But Christ over and over again told us, he taught us the importance of just being a servant. What great works. What wonders we could do for the cause of Christ if no one got the credit, but we simply gave it all to God. Christ wanted them to know that is all about the Father in heaven. You see, everything we need physically speaking is taken care of because of the family of God. We see in the book of Acts, chapters 12 through 15, these individuals sold their possessions to make sure their brothers' and sisters' needs were taken care of. In the family of God, we have everything we could ever ask for. The ideas of rewards in heaven is foreign to many and rejected by others. 
They feel rewards or rank and position or possessions and levels of responsibility have no place in a perfect world. However, Christ himself endured the cross that was set before him. Hebrews 2, Hebrews 12, verse 2. In our text this morning, in Mark 10, verse 28, Peter makes an interesting statement. He said, Christ, lo, we have left all and have followed thee. In this very chapter, right before Peter said what he said, we have an individual coming to Jesus. And this individual asked Christ, good master, what shall I do so I can inherit eternal life? So Christ began to tell him all he had to do in order to follow him. But as we all know, well, as the text says, these in the, with this individual here, he did not want to give up what meant the most to him in order to follow Christ. Many want a religion that is based on a matter of convenience and not co- re- relates on a matter of convenience and not conviction. They want a religion that cost them nothing, but if Christ gave his life, shouldn't we be willing to give up something to follow him? Shouldn't we be willing to give up our pride, our egos, a false religion in order to follow the true son of God? Jesus is going to use Peter's answer to teach all of us a great and important lesson. Peter said, Christ, we have left all. They had left all for Christ's sake and the gospel, as Mark 10, verse 29 records. They left their families. They left their friends. They left their businesses, their professions, their wealth. They left all to meet the needs of a sin-sick world. Everything they ever had, they committed to all to serving Christ. They gave up a lot to follow him. Think of something that means the most to you in the world, possession speaking. We have to be willing to give those things up to follow Christ. We have to be willing to give up whatever it is that is pulling us away from Christ. Whatever it is that is keeping us away from just making that one more step, we have to get rid of all those things to make sure we truly Follow Christ. Any person who leaves and follows Christ, they can't expect the reward. There is a wonderful truth that Christ, this is a wonderful truth that Christ is teaching his apostles. You have a man who will not give up his temporal rewards for eternal rewards. They again were uneasy because they just had heard about what happened to the rich young ruler. And because of Jesus' comments about the incident, Jesus wanted to assure them they were very dear to him. And because he had left all for them, they were going to be rewarded greatly in heaven. The true disciple receives the rewards of persecution. If we are truly going to follow Christ, we need to know there is going to be persecution. We need to know things are not going to be a walk in the park. We need to know things are not going to be as easy as we have planned them. But that's what it means to follow Christ. That's what it means to truly give up all you want, all you desire, all you have to make sure I am totally committing my life to the will of God. Peter tells us, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ. Notice what Peter says here. He says, happy are ye. For the spirit of the glory of God rested upon you on their part. He is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. First Peter 4 and verse 14. The believer suffers for righteousness as well. When a disciple suffers for Christ, the spirit of the glory of God, it rests upon him. But also in suffering for Christ, the disciple experiences a very special identification with Jesus Christ himself. You see, our faith validates our belief, and our belief, it indeed validates our faith. We have faith in God. We are trusting in God. And when you really think of the definition of faith, it's trust, it's conviction, and what God has said to believe it and to do it as well. James said, be ye doers of the word 
and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man who beholdeth his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth his face and goeth his way and straightway forget what manner of man he was. Verse 25, James says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful doer, but a faithful doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. What are we trusting? But a better question is, who are we trusting? God demands that we trust him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible to please God without faith. There are two things in this verse we must trust about the God of heaven. We must trust his nature, that he's eternal. We are being to ask to trust he who which is eternal. He who has no beginning and he who has no end. He who is outside of time, we are being asked to trust the God of heaven. The Bible says, in the beginning, God. We are, being, we are asked to be in trust the creator of the entire world. We are being asked to trust the one who created us. We are asked to, be, to, to trust the one we are made in the image of. We are being asked to trust the all-powerful God, the God who is, who is unrestricted by the measure of time. He is power. He is all-powerful. Is there anything too hard for the God of heaven? The answer is simply no. And that should move us more to trust his word. He knows everything that can ever be known. We are not only being asked to trust his nature, but we are asked to be, we are asked to trust his character. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He is holy. He is perfect. He is just. He is right. He is truth. He cannot lie. He is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He never tempts any man, and he himself cannot be tempted. James 1 and verse 13. According to the scriptures, faith is knowing. It's not guessing. The way faith originates, it demands that we know and that we trust the God of heaven. This teaching is God giving his word. God's word teaches us that we rely on him. The word of God is trustworthy because of these two attributes, his nature and his character. What it means is, is that God can do what he says because of his nature and because of his power. And God will do what he says because of who he is and because he cannot lie. Faith knows because God gave his word. And since it's truth, it can't be trusted. God's exhortation throughout the Bible is show me your faith. God's exhortation to each of us is show me your faith. Show me how much you believe in me. Show me how much you understand me. Show me how much you believe in my word. God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth. And what does Noah do? What does God tell Noah? Noah, show me your faith. Make an ark. Get the gopher wood. God gave him everything he needed, and the next step depended on Noah. God had already told Noah what to do, but now Noah has to respond in faith to what God has just told him to do. That's faith. Doing exactly what God has told us to do. And the Bible says in Genesis 6, verse 22, thus did Noah according to all that God had required. So the Bible tells us by faith Noah, he moved with fear, preparing his house. God's exhortation to Noah is show me your faith. Moses, put the blood on the doorpost, and when I see that blood, I'll pass over you. Joshua, I have given you this day Jericho. Show me your faith and march around the walls. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. How was that? Because they did what God told them to do. Anytime we do what God tells us to do, 
we are always going to be safe. Anytime we listen to the will of God, anytime we do exactly what God has commanded for us to do, we are always going to be okay. Our life may not be easy, but if we do the will of God, we are going to have that reward that's in heaven. Being a child of God is the greatest experience you can ever have in your life. Again, think of all the great things that mean so much to you in life. But if it's the one thing that should mean the most to you, it's that you have that relationship with God, you have to put Christ on in baptism. And if you have not put Christ on in baptism, we plead with you, we beg you, we implore you, so you too can enjoy the blessings of the family of God as well. Naaman, you want to be cleansed. Show me your faith. Go dip in this river seven times. It's rather ironic that people are questioning God. People are doubting whether or not God is going to do what he said he was going to do. But the Bible speaks about Abraham in Romans 4, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his body when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he staggered at the promises of unbelief. And the Bible says, in being fully persuaded, and he being fully persuaded, he knew that God was going to give him what he had promised because Abraham knew God. Truth of the matter is, friends, we cannot fake faith because when God gives us his grace, we need to respond to that grace. Titus tells us, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that, that, that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. And what God grace teaches us, it demands us that we show him our faith. Those apostles had a great deal of faith to follow Christ. Faith can be seen because God can be taught. The Bible says in Romans 8, verse 24, if we can see something, why are we going to hope for it? As Christians, it gives us that much anticipation to know for a fact, if I live the life Christ wants me to live, I can go to heaven. And that should whet our appetite more to serve him. So when James says, show me your faith, it's because we can and we must. In scripture, being faithless is called unbelief. This is why the account in Numbers 12 through 14 of the 10 spies is so offensive to God. They didn't think God could do it, so thus they didn't think they could do it. Because they doubted, because they doubted God, they didn't believe whether or not themselves could do what God had told them to do. God cannot. He will not. He does not approve of any faceless person becoming his child. We must show God how much we love him by doing exactly what he has told us to do. Throughout the Bible, it speaks volumes about our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. By faith, the elders attain a good report. These all died in faith. Lord, increase our faith. The be not faith is but believing. Fight the good fight of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible speaks volumes about the faith we should have with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. If we were cars, faith is the fuel that moves us. Without that fuel, you can have the best car in the world, but it won't take you far. If we were houses, faith is the foundation on which our spiritual houses stand. Without that foundation, our houses are going to be, be built on the shifting sand. And when the storms of life come, our houses are going to fall away. If we were ships, faith is the anchor that securely fastens us to shore. Without it, we will be a ship on the sea of life without no possible way of getting back home. No one can enter into God's kingdom without faith. It's simply impossible. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to the kingdom of heaven. Noah, I, 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 I know you've never seen rain, Noah, but I want you to build an ark. Joshua, I know you've never done this before, 
but march around the walls of Jericho. Moses, death is coming. Put the blood over the doorpost. I'll pass over you. In all of this, the most important lesson is to follow Jesus. We are learning about God the Father. Anytime we read and study our Bibles, we need to know we are learning about God. Genesis 3 is not just about Adam and Eve. It's about God's redemptive plan for mankind. Genesis 4, it's not just about Cain and Abel. It's about God wanting to be merciful to sinners. Genesis 6 through 10, it's not just about Noah, but it's about the grace of God and him wanting to save humanity. 2 Kings 5, it's not just about Naaman. It's so that Assyria can know there is no God like Jehovah. Mark 10, verse 28 to 31, it's not just about who then can enter into heaven. It's about those who follow Christ will have a reward in heaven. This is why Jesus is so great and the reason we need to follow him the most. God makes the standard the blood of Christ. The world makes the standards the degrees we have, the money we have in our accounts, the cars we drive, the homes we live in. The world makes this the standard. But God simply makes the standard the blood of his dear son, Jesus Christ. It's sad that people grow to unlearn. It's sad that people grow up unlearned, unaccepted, and fail to know Christ. Many are told they are not good enough. They don't have enough. If only, if only someone would take those people, take them to the arms of Jesus so he can love them, so he can care for them, we'll have more people added to the Lord's church. Because when we take them to the arms of Jesus, he will love them. He will care for them. But most of all, he is going to save them. All of us this very day, we know someone who's not a Christian. We know someone who has built their foundation on the sand and the storms of life come. They are simply falling away. That's why we need more Christians to bring others to Christ. After Lazarus died, after Paul died, after Noah died, after Joshua died, after Peter died, after Moses died, after Lydia died, after Dorcas died the second time, all these great men and women of God are now in paradise. As Christians, that should be our goal. Many that are first shall be last and the last first. It's vital this morning that we follow Jesus. It's vital this morning that you give up what you want and simply give your life to Christ. The greatest thing you can ever do with your life, listen to me, the greatest thing you can ever do with your life is to become a Christian. I very often had the opportunity of visiting a lot of older sisters where I preach. And if you talk to them, the only thing they care about the most, listen to this, the only thing they care about the most is that their children are faithful to God. That's it. They don't want the money. They don't want the cars. They don't want any earthly possession we can give them. The only thing they want to know is that their children are faithful to God. If, we're, if you're not a Christian this morning, we beg you, we beseech you to become a child of God. There are so many blessings. There are so many great memories you are going to have as a Christian. So Paul would say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, it took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found as a fashion, being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God bless you this morning. I will ever